Today, actually, uh, something that has not been mentioned is that uh, we are very grateful for the immense support uh, from participants from Southeast Asian countries. So there are uh, people from Myanmar over there, and uh, also from uh, uh, Malaysia, Thailand, and, and uh, Indonesia. So uh, uh, we are indeed grateful that they are able to attend despite the fact that it's so close to Chinese New Year. <laughs> and uh, we're also grateful for that the rest are able to attend, despite the fact that it is near, uh, the office hour is going to be over soon. Um, well, late afternoon. Today, uh, this, today we have uh, a series of very uh, interesting talks on quantum mechanics regarding the foundation, uh, even quantum cosmology, cosmology is, and, and, and other topics, but uh, we have no experimentalists yet, and uh, physics is all about experiment. Uh, without experiment, uh, there will be no physics. And so we are indeed glad that in our next sessions, we have two very distinguished speakers. Uh, the first one being uh, Stuart Parking, uh, formerly from IBM, but now he's with uh, Max Planck Institute in uh, well, in, in Germany. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the floor is yours. Uh, see it. Is that any better? No? No. I use this one? No, I don't have it. This one? This one? Yeah. Oh, right. this is okay. okay. All right, let me try to begin. Uh, you could hear me at the back? Good. Okay. So, um, as was mentioned, I would like to discuss something about how we could use quantum mechanics uh, to create interesting devices. And I want to, in particular, talk about the field of spintronics, which is the field of utilizing the spin of the electron to create currents of spin-polarized electrons to, mip to manipulate those currents to do useful things. And in particular, this has been extremely useful in our ability to store data digital data. And so what I'd like to do is briefly discuss the last 25 years of spintronics, and in particular the last 10 years, in which the interest has switched to spin orbitronics, when we look at phenomena that involve the coupling of the electron spin to its orbits. And this can create very interesting new uh, uh, materials and phenomena that were unforeseen even two or three years ago. So let me just... Uh Go to the first foil. So, um, the, uh, in, my chairman had difficulty understanding where this uh, Max Planck Institute is. So here is a picture of the Max Planck Institute for Microstructure Physics. It's in a city called Halle. It's a very historic city. It's about an hour from Berlin. And uh, in this city, there's a very old university, the Martin Luther University. You probably are aware that this is the 500th anniversary of Martin Luther's declarations. And I recently moved there about a year ago, and I'm rebuilding this institute to focus on the materials and phenomena that could enable us to build interesting devices that go beyond conventional charge-based devices for memory and for logic. And so this is a little bit of advertising. We also have a lot of positions for PhDs and postdocs and junior group leaders and even two directors for the institute. But if we just go back 25 years, then this concept of manipulating currents of spin-polarized electrons, this is possible in magnetic Hertz structures in which you combine ultra-thin magnetic and non-magnetic layers. And by changing the magnetic configuration of this structure, you can evolve the flow of current because it is innately spin-polarized. And the concept of the, the idea that current in a magnetic film is carried by electrons of one spin orientation. That dates back to the 1930s. But it was in 1988 that uh, Albert Fert and Peter Grimberg discovered that certain, in fact one, they both looked at the same magnetic Hertz structure. When you had layers of iron separated by layers of a particular thickness of chromium, they discovered the material was 
anti-ferromagnetic, -ferro but you could reorient these magnetic layers in, in magnetic fields, and the resistance dropped by about a factor of two at low temperatures, but it required enormous magnetic fields. So my work, uh, I showed that one could develop new types of structures, we call them spin valves, in which we could manipulate these magnetic moments in much smaller magnetic fields and create systems or devices in which we could, de we could detect the tiny magnetic fields that would influence the resistance of this spin valve structure through changes in the magnetic orientations of the magnetic moments in a sandwich of two magnetic layers separated by a thin layer of copper. So we could evolve the current distribution, the amount of current flowing because of this spin polarization of the electronic current. And this led us to, in I invented this thing we called a spin valve, which enabled us to detect about a magnetic fields a thousand times smaller than was previously possible at room temperature for the particular application, a magnetic disk drive. So we could improve or increase the storage capacity of these disk drives by a thousand times because of this uh, invention. I'm not going to say much more about that, but of course this is behind big data and our ability to access all the information through cloud today. All of it is stored in these digital magnetic disk drives using this spintronic spin valve sensor to detect those magnetic regions. Now, about 25 years ago, we proposed another technology which involves a different physics of spin currents, and that involves uh, spin-dependent tunneling. So it's been known in, since the 1970s that if you extract current from a magnetic film uh, in vacuum or through an insulator, the current is innately spin-polarized. And this is now we know for two reasons. One is that in a magnetic material, because of that broken symmetry, the magnetization leads to different numbers of electronic states spin-polarized in one direction and in the opposite direction at room temperature. So when you extract current, inevitably, there will be a greater current of one spin polarization compared to the other. What we first demonstrated 10 years ago was that then if you combined two magnetic layers shown in this cartoon in a magnetic tunnel junction in which they're separated by a thin layer of a particular form of an insulator, this insulator itself can further spin polarize the current because if there is strong spin orbit coupling, then electron wave functions of one spin orientation have a different wave function symmetry than electrons with the opposite spin polarization. And then let's say uh, the electrons of one spin orientation are more S-like, their uh, wave functions are more extended, and they will have a greater probability of tunneling through a thin dielectric material compared to electrons which are more localized. And it turns out that for some magnetic materials, this is the case, that the wave functions of the spin up and spin spin down electrons are sufficiently distinct that their tunneling spin probabilities through thin dielectrics are quite distinct. And this means effectively we can create a current which is nearly 100% spin polarized by filtering out electrons of one spin orientation in this way, based on this concept of wave function symmetries. And this leads to these magnetic tunnel junction devices, a sandwich of two magnetic layers separated by thin dielectric in which we can control the tunneling current by simply changing the orientation of these magnetic layers. When the magnetic layers are parallel, then the electrons which are tunneling of one spin orientation can find states of the same empty, same spin orientation into which they can tunnel, but when we reverse the, polar, the magnetic moment of one of the layers, so they're anti-parallel, these same spin polarized electrons can find no states into which they can tunnel, and then the current is reduced. And at room temperature today, we can see changes in resistance of several hundred percent, even up to a factor of 10. And this is about 100 times larger than is possible using conventional spin valves that we invented, but which are based on spin-dependent scattering within the magnetic interfaces in heterostructures. This leads then to the concept we could build a very interesting memory in which we store information as the direction of magnetization of one of these layers. If the reference magnetic electrode is essentially pinned, which we can do. I'm not going to discuss that. And so we proposed, in fact, in 1995, that we could build something we called a magnetic random access memory in which information is stored as the direction of moment, magnetization of one of these layers, and we can detect it very readily by simply the resistance of this tunnel junction depending on the orientation of this magnetization. Now, the means of writing this information has evolved over the last few years since we proposed this technology. Originally, we proposed using currents passing through 
copper lines to generate small magnetic fields to switch the magnetization. This doesn't scale to small dimensions. But what was found in the 1980s and 90s was that the same current which is spin polarized is, of course, delivering spin angular momentum. And therefore, this can be used to provide torques on magnetic layers to switch them from one direction to the other. And this is the essence of what is now called uh, spin transfer torque switching or spin transfer torque MRAM. Now, I want, I'm not going to discuss much more about this technology, uh, just to point out that it takes a long time from uh, a proposal uh, in this field to go from, uh, from a uh, concept to a real application. And I just wanted to show you how that is. So we proposed this in 1995. We actually had money from the military to build a first prototype, which we actually did a few years later in 1999, a 1,000-bit MRAM memory that actually worked. And later on, 2005, that takes 10 years, we built a fully functioning 16 megabit MRAM chip. But even today, it's not really possible to buy MRAM memory technology with any significant numbers of bits. But nevertheless, this is regarded as the most important emerging technology, memory technology, that could enable further scaling of memory technologies like flash, DRAM, SRAM in the future. All of those charge-based memories are coming to the end of their technology roadmaps. And indeed, the major memory companies today, like Samsung, Micron, Global Foundries, Intel, all are investing in this technology, as are a number of startup companies. However, after 20 years, it will have taken approximately $2 billion of investment to get to the point where one could buy a memory of this type. We believe that will happen in the next this year or next year. So uh, this is uh, another success of Spintronics, but you can see it takes a significant amount of time. And I just wanted to point out that this technology is innately two-dimensional, like all existing charge-based memory and logic technologies. And this is why there's a problem in scaling these technologies beyond the current technology. Perhaps one can scale uh, one or two so-called technology nodes, but it seems like we're coming to the end of the roadmap of charge-based memory memory and logic technologies. We need to do something else. And spin-based technologies is one possibility. I'd like to discuss briefly this concept, which is, I think, a very interesting concept, of course, because I proposed it. I called it racetrack memory. And this is innately three-dimensional. The concept here is that we take a magnetic wire. It can be homogeneous, maybe a few nanometers wide and a micron tall. And in this magnetic wire, we write information in the form of magnetic regions pointing in one direction or the other. And these boundaries, the boundaries here shown as the regions between these blue and red regions which are pointing in opposite magnetic directions, these boundaries or domain walls are where we store the information. The presence or absence of these boundaries represents zeros and ones. But the most important idea here is that we shift this information up and down these magnetic nanowires in order that we could store a hundred of these magnetic bits, a hundred bits of information in the same area of a silicon wafer that today we would store one. So we can improve the memory density by a hundred times and at the same time uh, the performance is uh, very good. We could write and read in a, in a fraction of a nanosecond and this type of memory technology while having the the same capacity as a magnetic disk drive will be a million times faster and use a hundred times less energy or so. And the concept is that this racetrack memory, each of these racetracks has a writing and a reading device. But the underlying fundamental principle is that we could manipulate or move a series of these magnetic domain walls by passing current through this racetrack. And I'd like to briefly discuss this concept. So it's really based originally, as I mentioned, on Neville Mott's concept in the 1930s, soon after uh, the concept of the spin of the electron was proposed. And the concept is that if you take a magnetic material shown in blue, magnetized in this direction, you introduce current from a battery, equal numbers of spin up and spin down electrons, but within a few mean free paths, the current will be carried largely by electrons of one spin orientation, which have a less scattering than the other electron spin because 
the magnetization breaks the symmetry, so electrons which are parallel or antiparallel will be scattered at different rates. So this leads to the concept that the current within this magnetic material is innately carried by electrons of one spin orientation. And in some nickel and cobalt-based alloys, the current is about 70% spin polarized. So therefore, we carry spin angular momentum, and this current of spin angular momentum can be, for example, delivered to a magnetic domain wall. And when the electron spin in this current passes this domain wall, it will adiabatically reverse its spin orientation and deliver a quantum of spin angular momentum to the magnetic moments in this domain wall. And effectively, for every electron of one spin orientation that crosses, we can effectively switch about one magnetic moment. So if the current is large enough, we can start to move the domain wall, as shown here in this way. And on a nanoscopic scale, these domain walls, these boundaries between magnetic regions magnetized in opposite direction, have a very well-defined magnetic structure. And effectively, they behave like tiny particles with mass and with momentum. The most important point is that these domain walls, the next, this domain wall and the next one and the next one, all can be moved in the same direction, in the direction of the flow of the spin angular momentum, which is un impossible, for example, using magnetic fields, which usually one uses to manipulate magnetic moments. So again, we were able to show this is, uh, this, this is feasible, and in 2008 we published this paper where we built the first current-controlled domain wall shift register, where we could introduce a series of domain walls, measure their presence in a magnetic nanowire simply by the resistance of the wire, which is affected by the presence of these domain walls. It actually lay lower the resistance of the wire. And we could introduce domain walls and, and exit the domain walls from the wire and build a shift register in which we demonstrated we could store information in this series of domain walls. Now, this concept, though, used these nickel iron soft magnetic materials in which inevitably the domain walls are very large objects, They're not really useful for applications. So I want to just briefly discuss then how spin orbitronics, if you like, has evolved over just the last few years to make this concept of magnetic racetrack memory even more interesting, I believe. And effectively, we've gone through these four stages of, if you like, evolution, where each stage has evolved uh, the discovery of some new physics that was unanticipated prior to that stage. And I'm only really going to discuss these last two stages. So we've moved from racetracks in which the current creates spin-polarized electrons and angular momentum within the interior of the magnetic layer to creating spin currents in adjacent metal layers, which are heavy with strong spin-orbit coupling, and through something called the spin Hall effect. And I'd like to briefly discuss that uh, in the next few minutes. And again, this technology is innately three-dimensional. So here's an example, for example, of a racetrack. It's a, a linear racetrack uh, in which we have 20 domain walls. And we're moving these, as you can see, from left to right by passing current pulses on the order of a few nanoseconds uh, in a right direction or a left direction. And the racetrack itself is made from an atomically layered Hertra structure. It's actually very interesting. Here is the structure. It consists, you see these green layers. This lower green layer is about uh, 1.5 to 3 angstroms of cobalt, as is this upper green layer, separated by a few angstroms of nickel. And so it's just an ultra-thin, one nanometer thick racetrack in which the magnetization is perpendicular to these layers because the Hertra structure breaks the symmetry and leads to the uh, significant magnetic anisotropy orienting the moments perpendicular to these interfaces. Well, the next most important point is that we grow this sandwich of cobalt, nickel cobalt, on this orange layer, which is a layer of heavy metal like platinum. It could be tungsten or tantalum, but platinum is most effective. And then we find the domain walls move in this, as I just showed, at about 300 meters per second. In the previous example, in these soft magnetic materials, the maximum velocity is determined by how much current we can pass through those wires without essentially melting the wire. And that means we could move the domain walls at about 100 meters per second. Here, they're going a lot faster. Moreover, they're no longer moving in the direction of spin angular momentum created by spin-dependent scattering within the cobalt and nickel layers. They're moving in the opposite direction. And this was discovered just five years ago, uh, first by Miron, and then we followed up and understood the mechanism by which this happens. <laughs> 
And I don't really have time to discuss this in detail, but what's interesting is that there are four spin orbit derived phenomena that are critical to making this possible, to making it possible to move the domain walls with short current pulses at such high velocities. So for example, if we made a wrist track from many cobalt and nickel layers, much thicker, then the domain walls would move in the direction of spin angular momentum at about 100 meters per second. If we make them ultra thin, uh, then the current passing through this underlayer is what determines the spin current and the direction and the velocity of the domain walls. But as I mentioned, one very important spin orbit drive phenomenon is that the moments are perpendicular to these layers because of the broken symmetry through these interfaces. Now, because of the large magnetic anisotropy, this means these magnetic domain walls, the, the, will the regions between magnetization pointing in opposite direction shrinks. This will be, they will shrink, it will be much tinier the domain wall as the magnetic anisotropy grows, well, that will then minimize the energy by shrinking the domain walls. It's a, a ratio of this perpendicular magnetic anisotropy to the innate exchange within the magnetic layers. But a second very interesting point is that these domain walls, the structure of the walls, are chiral. And this is due to a very special exchange interaction. It's called the dielaginsky maria interaction. And that's set by the interface between this lower magnetic layer and this heavy metal layer of platinum. And essentially what it means is that the magnetic moments no longer want to be aligned parallel as in a ferromagnet or antiparallel as in antiferromagnet. They want to be aligned at 90 degrees to each other in a chiral fashion. So a dielaginsky maria exchange vector defines this exchange interaction. And it's a three-body interaction between two magnetic atoms and the platinum atoms in the layer. And it's a spin-orbit coupling derived from these heavy platinum atoms that determines the strength of this interaction. So what does it mean? It means it's chiral. And that means as we move along the racetrack, the magnetization will rotate from an up to a down direction in a plane parallel to the racetrack. These are so-called nail walls because of this dielaginsky maria interaction. And you can see in this first domain wall, the magnetization rotates so that there's a, in the middle of the wall, the moment is pointing to your right. And now when the magnetization rotates from a down to an up direction, then the magnetization in the middle of the wall points to your left because this is a chiral, in this case a clockwise, dielaginsky maria exchange. Now by changing the uh, underlayer here, or by changing this magnetic material, even from copper to nickel, we can change the sign of this dielaginsky maria interaction and the chirality of these walls. But the chiral nature is essential to our ability to manipulate these domain walls. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. Something I'm not going to talk about is there's also a very large proximity-induced magnetization. The cobalt layer will induce in the platinum, in about 10 angstroms, very significant magnetization, which also plays a role. I want to briefly talk now, finally, the fourth spin orbit derived phenomenon that's critically important is something called the spin hall effect. So you're all familiar with the standard conventional hall effect where a current in the presence of a large magnetic field will generate a voltage across a layer. In the spin hall effect, we pass a current into a wire and through spin orbit coupling, we generate a spin current, which again is chiral and which is rotating around the surface of this material in either a clockwise or an anti-clockwise direction. And the direction of these uh, moments, these spins, is orthogonal to both the direction of the current and the direction around which they flow. What does this mean? This means on the surface of this, let's say, platinum wire, on the top surface, we will accumulate, as you can see here, uh, spins pointing to your left. But on the lower surface, they will be accumulated pointing to your right because of this chiral interaction defined by this spin orbit coupling. And this, again, this chirality of this phenomenon can be clockwise or anticlockwise, depending upon the origin of the scattering, whether intrinsic or extrinsic, which gives rise to this phenomenon. Now, the concept now is that, uh, this, that once we've accumulated uh, spin density on a surface, then that's, those spins can diffuse into a neighboring magnetic layer and thereby deliver spin angular momentum. And again, let me point out that this current that is flowing is a pure spin current around the surface. There's no charge current that flows. Equal numbers of electrons. Anyway, there's no charge current that flows. Okay, so now, now we want to take that 
uh, spin polarized carriers, diffuse them into a neighboring magnetic layer, and then we can see, we can measure using uh, different experimental techniques the torque that that spin current applies on that, those magnetic moments. We can even switch the magnetization direction. So by measuring that torque, we can then determine the strength or the magnitude of the spin accumulation, the numbers of spin polarized electrons diffusing across that interface. And so typically, let's say, if we took a layer of nickel iron, a permalloy layer on platinum, we would see that the so-called spin hole angle, which effectively is the efficiency with which we can translate charge current into this perpendicular spin current, is about 5%. But if you take the same platinum material and use cobalt as the magnetic material, you'll find this spin hole angle is about 11%. Now what happens is, not surprisingly, the interface has a different transparency for spin current passage in the case of platinum permalloy compared to platinum cobalt. Once we measure that and fix it, we find that the spin hole angle, the efficiency of conversion of charge to spin current, is about 20% in platinum. Now, this is remarkably high. It's totally unexpected just a few years ago. We just published this last uh, two years ago. Now, it turns out that this concept of using charge currents in different materials to create spin currents is incredibly interesting and has evolved enormously in just the last two or three years. And I want to briefly mention another system which is very interesting, and again, this is the evolution of the field of spintronics, is evolving from simpler to more complex magnetic structures. And one of the most interesting is, for example, a triangular antiferromagnetic structure, which is actually found in many systems uh, in which you have a triangular arrangement of atoms in which the moments want to be antiparallel to one another, but instead they form the lowest energy configuration, this triangular state where you see the moments are pointing at 120 degrees to each other. It turns out again this is chiral, there are two possible ways in which they can be oriented. And uh, this leads in some systems to what is called a Berry phase. Uh, effectively, the electrons see a huge internal magnetic field, which is oriented uh, uh, to out of this plane defined by these uh, moments on these, in this case, manganese atoms in a simple FCC, a simple cubic iridium manganese three structure. So of course, what that means is, you can imagine, there are many of these 111 planes. Uh, so there are therefore, consequently, many anti-ferromagnetic domains. Now what we've discovered is that if we pass current into parallel to this layer, we will generate a huge spin current uh, in different directions, which it turns out to be completely anisotropic. And I just want to, as an aside, say, by controlling these domains, by orienting all these anti-ferromagnetic domains in a particular orientation, which we can do by an exchange interaction across an interface with a neighboring magnetic material, when we magnetize this neighboring layer in a perpendicular direction to the interface, go above the so-called blocking temperature of this anti-ferromagnetic material, so the domains can reorient themselves. You cool back down, and you find that this spin hole angle, which was about 20%, very, very high, is almost doubled to 35 or 40%. So these types of non-collinear spin structures with no net magnetization give rise to very large uh, spin hall angles. Again, this was unanticipated just a year ago. This is quite remarkable. And we have theoretical support to show that this same system not only even though it has no net magnetization, it actually also shows a giant anomalous hole conductivity, a conductivity and hole effect which usually is sustained by a magnetic moment. Here there's no, net, no magnetic moment, but the large Berry phase gives rise to this large anomalous hole conductivity. This is as a function of energy away from the Fermi energy. And as I mentioned, there are two chiral structures, and the anomalous hole effect changes sign depending upon the chirality of these domains, whereas the spin hole conductivity doesn't change sign. So this is very interesting. Again, technologically, we could use these giant spin currents for useful applications. But of course, fundamentally, it's also extremely interesting that these types of nonclinear spin textures could give rise to these very interesting uh, whole effects. And so I just want to summarize this part of the talk by saying that just in the last 10 years, uh, we've gone from the first observation of the spin hole effect. It was predicted in the 1960s and 70s. It was first observed by David Oshlam when he was at Santa Barbara. So a tiny effect, 10 to the minus 4, and then in the, uh, for a few, maybe almost a decade, people were looking at gold and platinum, saw tiny effects, 
But now it's well established by ourselves and others that platinum does indeed show a large effect, 20%. And, and the biggest effect seen in a, non, in a conventional material is this effect of, it turns out to be negative, minus 50% that we found recently in tungsten, which is slightly oxidized. And uh, more recently still, a couple of groups in Cornell, Dan Ralph's group, and uh, Kang Wang's group at UCLA, at UCLA have claimed that in certain topological metals or topological insulators, the surface states in which you see momentum spin locking, they claim that you can see even larger spin hole angles exceeding one. And in Kang Wang's case, he claims even 100, which would mean one charged electron would create 100 spin polarized uh, electrons accumulating, spin, 100 spin polarized electrons, which would be remarkable. It hasn't yet been confirmed, I would say. But I want to just briefly then show you how this spin hole effect leads to the motion of the main walls at high speed. So let's go back to the racetrack and the same uh, domain nail, domain walls I showed. But now we're going to look on top of the racetrack. So here is the top. Here the moment is pointing out of the plane. Here is the domain wall. And here the moment points into the plane. So this is the nail domain wall. And this is in the absence of current. So now we pass uh, first, OK, now we, I mentioned well, we have this very interesting chiral uh, exchange, the dilizinski mirror exchange. What that looks like is that here in the middle of this domain wall, there's a very large exchange field pointing to your left. And in this one, pointing to your right, sustaining the magnetization pointing in the middle of the domain wall to the left and to the right. But now when we introduce current, then as I mentioned, the current which is passing through an underlying heavy metal platinum layer generates a spin current shown here. These spins diffuse from this metal layer into the domain wall and therefore deliver spin angular momentum. They apply torque. The magnetic moments in the domain walls, both the neighboring domain walls, start to rotate towards this direction. And that means they're no longer oriented along the exchange field. And therefore, there's a torque applied to the magnetic moments. And it turns out, because of this chiral nature of the DMI and the chiral spin hole effect, that the torque on this domain wall causes these moments to rotate into this blue direction, and here these red moments to rotate into the red direction. So these domains, all the domains along this racetrack move in the same direction. Now, this would not be the case if we did not have this dilizinski maria exchange interaction to stabilize the magnetizations in the domain wall in chiral directions along the wire. And we, we actually were the first to show this mechanism, why it works, and how it can lead to velocities of domain walls several times higher than is possible from any spin angular momentum created through spin dependent scattering within the magnetic materials. Again, it's very interesting and useful for applications. Now, finally, for a technology point of view, all magnetic systems give rise to long-range dipolar field, as shown here. So let's say we have a racetrack with moments pointing up and down. Then inevitably, there will be some stray fields. And this will limit our ability to pack these domain walls close together. And it turns out this has been uh, an essential ingredient of all devices in spintronics since the beginning of spintronics, and indeed this spin valve sensor invented, the most critical aspect is that we could eliminate the magnetization of the layers by uh, in my, uh, my invention of what I call a synthetic antiferromagnetic material. I'm going to show that in a moment, and that's what we can do here also for this racetrack. We need to eliminate these dipole fields, and we can do this by creating a so-called synthetic antiferromagnetic racetrack. We essentially take two racetracks, one on top of each other, coupled through an ultra-thin ruthenium layer that gives rise to a very, very strong anti-ferromagnetic coupling. And again, this was something I discovered uh, 25 years ago, that you get a long-range oscillatory exchange coupling through all the transition metals, which we could use to create artificial spin-engineered materials. So in this way, we built a, a racetrack, two racetracks. And you can see the upper racetrack is an exact mirror image of whatever magnetization profile is in the lower racetrack when we couple these two layers through this ultra-thin ruthenium layer. And so now we can design this structure so that anywhere along the racetrack there's no net magnetization, no dipole fields, and this, we believe, is the last fundamental uh, barrier to uh, building useful structures from such materials. And incidentally, we discovered that the velocity with which the domain walls move under current through such a racetrack 
it turns out to be five times higher than in the individual racetracks or if we coupled these ferromagnetically. And it turns out, I don't want to go into any detail, but it's the very strong anti-ferromagnetic exchange field that uh, acts one layer on the other that gives rise to additional torques that causes these uh, domain walls to move much more efficiently, about five times as efficiently. So we've now achieved speeds of motion of these domain walls exceeding one kilometer per second for useful current densities. And this means, we believe, we can make very, very interesting devices. So just to summarize then, we've moved from, in the last three years, from this uh, single racetrack to this synthetic racetrack. And here's a synthetic racetrack. And you can see, more difficult to see the domains because there's no magnetization. We're using a, a magneto-optic Kerr effect microscope to measure these domains. And these domain walls are moving five times faster than in the upper racetrack for the same current density. And so in some sense, this is a complex interplay of four spin orbit derived phenomena. The perpendicular magnetic anisotropy, proximity is due to magnetization, the chiral domain walls through this vector exchange, and the spin currents generated from the spin hole effect, all working in concert to make this, uh, I think, remarkable uh, high velocity of domain walls uh, moving together, all of them along a racetrack with limited reasonable current. Now, just as an aside, it turns out that we surprisingly discovered in the last year that if we introduced some curvature into this racetrack, surprisingly, because nobody had pointed this out for the last 10 years, even though I've been showing this cartoon, it turns out that the domain walls uh, move at different velocities, whether the curvature is positive or negative. And so, for example, here uh, you can see here are two domain walls which are close together. Uh, when we apply a current, they move around this curved wire, but the uh, forward domain wall moves much faster than the one behind, so that after we've moved them with current, you can see the separation of these domain walls is vastly increased. And here, where the curvature is the opposite, then the spacing between the domain walls shrinks. So this is amazing. So the curvature, uh, it turns out, strongly influences the speed of the domain walls and I've just shown here, this is the velocity of domain walls for two different curvatures as a function of current density. And you can see there's a significant difference in these velocities. And this, it turns out, is also quite interesting. It turns out that if you try to move a domain wall around this racetrack, then because the distance moved on the inner part of the racetrack is much less than on the outer part of the racetrack, therefore, you need to deliver more spin angular momentum on the outside than on the inside. And so the only way to establish this, to enable the constant motion of a domain wall, is that the domain wall has to rotate from being along the radial direction, which is preferred from an energetic perspective, to at an angle. And whether we have a uh, domain wall uh, ori orienting from a plus to a minus, from up to down, or down to up, the rotation of the domain walls will be different. And this allows, both explains the difference in velocity, but also enables these domain walls to move at a constant uh, uh, radial velocity, uh, uh, circular velocity around these wires. And this is obvious that uh, the domain wall velocity has to increase linearly across the radius, or the angular velocity has to be constant in equilibrium, which is what we find experimentally and by analytical modeling. And uh, it leads to one very interesting effect that the, uh, because of the, the dielajinsky maria interaction along the domain wall, the magnetization will always be, want to be perpendicular to the domain wall. And the time scale for that is very fast on a few hundred picoseconds. But the time scale to move the domain wall from being along the radius to being at an angle in this way to enable uh, the, the delivery of spin angular momentum to vary radially across the wire. That takes tens of nanoseconds, which was also quite a surprise. And we can see this experimentally. We can also see it theoretically. But you see, experimentally, the time taken for us to develop this final velocity, which is slower for one domain wall, compared to the other, up, down, and down, up, it takes several tens of nanoseconds, whereas the time taken for the moments to rotate along the dielajinsky mary interaction we find is a few hundred picoseconds. So there's very different dynamics because of this. And finally, if we then use the same synthetic anti ferromagnetic racetrack, again, it turns out that now the domain walls move at the same velocity around this racetrack. So this kind of engineered Hutter structure, using all this interesting physics developed just over the last few years, uh, is incredibly important to build such a device. So this is a very technical point, but it turns out that using uh, a single 
domain wall, which we can move backwards and forwards and detect with a magnetic tunnel junction. We believe this is a very interesting concept, which may be easier to build than a three-dimensional racetrack memory. And it would lead us, using these one kilometer uh, velocities that we've just recently found, we could build a device that would operate on 100 picoseconds, which is about the speed of the fastest charge-based memory today. This is static random access memory, but we could improve the density by factors of two or three or more, and it's also non-volatile and uses much less energy. So we think this could be a very interesting potential application of this new physics in spin orbitronics using this manipulation of domain walls to build an ultra-fast non-volatile memory. Now, I don't know how much time I have left, but I also wanted to mention that there are some very interesting other non-collinear spin textures beyond these nail domain walls. And perhaps some of you heard about this. These are called skimions, uh, first observed by Christian Flyder in Munich in manganese silicon a few years ago. So a number of groups around the world, uh, in particular the group at the University of Tokyo and Riken by uh, Tokura, have seen skimions in a wide variety of systems. And we ourselves have now seen it in this system. It's a hoistler material. This is grown from Claudia Feltz's group. And in a Lorentz transmission electron micrograph, you can see an evolution of a so-called helical phase where the magnetization is rotating around an axis in the plane to these, an array of these skimions where the magnetization uh, has, this, uh, uh, has this type of structure. And it turns out this also is a chiral and topological structure. And these arrays of uh, skimions also give rise to very interesting transport uh, anomalous hall effect, uh, topological hall effects. It turns out that finally, uh, non-collinear spin textures we can see in conventional materials. This, for example, is an ultra-thin cobaldine boron film grown on tungsten. And you can see in zero magnetic field in a Kerr microscope, can you see this magnetization? The black represents moment pointing up and the white pointing down. And so you see these striped domains, which is very typical of uh, perpendicularly magnetized material. It reduces the magnetostatic energy. And it turns out that just tiny magnetic fields, we can change this stripe to a stripe plus bubble. You see, now we're seeing magnetic bubbles. These are small regions where the magnetization points out of a film that's magnetized in the opposite direction. And eventually, we get to a single domain structure. But we just need a few ersteds to control this structure. And there's some very nice work from several groups looking at the motion of skimions and magnetic bubbles. This is from Axel Hoffman's group he published a year ago. And you can see, in this case, he's built a racetrack very similar to our early racetracks, in which by passing current, you can see these magnetic bubbles move around in response to uh, this current. However, so far, the speeds with which these skimmions move are quite small uh, compared to the uh, nail domain walls that I discussed. But nevertheless, these concepts of uh, topological structures, chiral in nature, giving rise to interesting spin orbitronic effects is, uh, is of significant interest. So I'm just going to summarize by saying I tried to discuss recent developments in the field of spin orbitronics, in particular, how we can obtain, due to chiral domain walls, enormous chiral spin torques, giant exchange torques in synthetic antiferromagnets. We can move domain walls at speeds that were unanticipated just a few years ago at kilometers per second. And I also wanted to point out that uh, this spin hall effect, the conversion of charge to spin current, has evolved enormously over just the last three or four years. And we can see this not only in heavy metals, in, in alloys, but also in these triangular antiferromagnetic systems. And we believe that this type of spin orbitronics leads to several important technological applications, including this racetrack, uh, and also a three-terminal single domain wall racetrack could be a replacement for static random access memory. These types of devices promise a low energy, high performance, uh, and non-volatility, uh, and I think this is uh, very interesting. So I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you for this very fantastic talk. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering whether there's, um, I've seen a lot of tremendous development in the storage of spin channel applications. Uh, how about the logic uh, applications? I oh, okay. haven't seen spin FET and haven't been realized. And what is the technological hurdles for that? 
I think so. Spin logic, there are not so many great ideas. Originally, in the beginning of Spintronics 20 years ago, uh, there was a lot of interest uh, by a number of groups, in particular David Oshlam, where you, the idea was you could inject spin polarized carriers, manipulate them, and then detect them, and somehow by gating the, for example, if you had very, very long coherence times and long coherence lengths, you could gate the electron spins, you could reorient it, and therefore build a transistor. But it turns out that uh, none of those devices have it, are, are useful because you're converting basically charge to spin and then back again is truly inefficient. So you're never better than a charge-based transistor. And since the investments in charge-based devices is just hundreds of billions of dollars a year, it's very difficult to compete. So there are other interesting ideas. For example, uh, and the other problem is that, uh, let's say, uh, if you want to build any interesting logic device, you really need low voltage. Uh, this is something that Eli Yablomovich has pointed out several times. He has a whole center in Berkeley to do this. Uh, and the reason is that typically all existing charge-based memories, the energy consumption is determined by the voltage you apply to lines. So you need to go to low voltage. And so there are interesting concepts where you could use, for example, interactions between, a cell in a cellular automator approach, you have magnetic blobs which interact through the dipole fields. So there was a lot of interest in that. That also has significant problems because basically one magnetic blob interacts with its neighbor and that neighbor interacts with the first one and it's difficult to be directional. And it turns out in nearly all cases, these long-range dipole fields are what is determining the propagation of information. So also, it seems that that approach is probably never going to work. So of course, there are others where you really use innately the spin current in interesting ways, and uh, uh, a number of uh, proposals have been made. But they are, um, yeah, there's still a long way to go before you could imagine any of these logic devices being potentially useful. And as you can see, magnetic random access memory, in order that it could be useful today, then the physics really had to change. It's only because of this incredibly interesting physics, really through spin orbitronics, that has made MRAM potentially possible. And as I mentioned in my beginning, it's now all major companies are working on it because of the, they don't know how to evolve. Like flash memory already, it's no longer scales. They're actually making it bigger, multiple layers. So there's a tremendous need for new technologies. And I think Spintronics could play a role in memory. But in my own mind for logic, one needs to go somewhere completely different. And as my own interest is actually in what I call cognitive devices or neuromorphic devices, where in fact we no longer want to use electrons or spins. We want to use currents of ions to manipulate matter from an insulating to a metallic state in three dimensions. And we believe, or I believe, in this way, we can build very interesting nonlinear networks and systems in which we could build neuromorphic uh, logic capability. That's what we're doing. Thank you very much. Right, Cecilia. Of course, there will always be a question from Cecilia. No, no, no. <coughs> no, I don't think that I have to ask a question now. You're but welcome to ask no, a question, no, of course. But the point is that, you know, uh, for example, I just want to, since this is a, a conference about history, you know, skirmions are very, very old concepts which were born in the UK and in nuclear physics, and they were considered to be mm. very strange objects, both bosonic and fermionic and all that. Sorry? In Malaya. In Malaya? Okay. Okay. I, I just wonder that. how such a concept mm. makes it to such a far away <laughs> region of physics, you know. How, how mm. do these, how, how, how do these, it's propagate in time. I mean, how do we go from a totally yeah. different region of physics to this? That's physics? right. I mean, in your case, this yeah. is you have a one mm. very con concrete example mm. of a skirmion. Sure. But do you know yeah. the history? How did it get there? Because I know that mm. field theory in condensed matter physics was introduced by an article. Mm. People say by mm. by Gelman. You know, he just wrote an article, mm. and then Gelman is a famous person, and pan. You know, so these ideas are now, I mean, I think, uh, my condensed matter yeah, yeah, they're think, always uh, talking about, mm, about mm -hmm, you know, sure. uh, concepts like I that. I think in the end, it's uh, the mathematical equations are similar. They're yeah, correlated, they're re related, and so the same equations that describe one phenomena can describe another, yeah, but and then you lead to similar recognize? conclusions. How do people recognize that so this is a scary? So people recognize this, it was actually Christian Fleider first recognized this by oh. simply neutron scattering, and he could see a, an array of these uh, skirmionic objects that uh, he appeared in a particular temperature pressure regime. Mm. 
And it turns out what, uh, so this was not at zero temperatures, not in zero pressure, but what has happened over the last few years is that uh, people have discovered these chemions actually uh, occur in very many different systems, in oxides, in metals, and uh, now you could stabilize them as I showed in my talk. These chemions are stable in zero magnetic zero magnetic field and at room temperature, therefore potentially useful. Whereas until to date, these skirmionic phases are stabilized in a magnetic field and in a very narrow temperature re regime. So it was uh, quite remarkable that they, they were observed, if you like, uh, but, of course, in some sense, it's also because the techniques have evolved. And as experimental techniques evolve, you can look in uh, parts of phase space that weren't accessible before. I'm not sure that answers your question. <coughs> Since skirmion is mentioned, I think uh, I would be remiss if I didn't tell you mm. something about the history of skirm, oh, fantastic. which you may or may not know. Mm. First of all, skirm uh, was clearly a eccentric Englishman. Mm. Uh, he taught. At I think the there are a lot of those. <laughs> he, but he, this this eccentricity mm. Mm. is six six degrees above the normal. Okay. Uh, he taught in Malaya, University mm. of Malaya. And uh, coming from United Kingdom to Malaya, he didn't do what normal people would do, mm. namely fly here. Uh -huh. He drove here. Oh, wow. That's okay. uh, totally unusual. That's, that's his eccentricity number one. Uh, uh -huh. But more important, he was the thesis advisor of the organizer of this conference. Oh, KK Poa. Where is he? Uh, oh. oh, OK. <laughs> well, anyway. Uh, OK. Anyway. Well, thank you for that comment. I'm, uh, that's uh, very interesting. OK. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. Thank you.